bigoted wedding store manager complains about my sales, so I bring in drag queens. I've posted once before about a situation when I was teaching, but I thought I would go back to one of my original acts of malicious compliance that happened while I was working my way through grad school. Once upon a time, in order to make ends meet during uni, I took a job working at a bridal shop. This shop involved mostly walk-ins who would buy dresses directly off the rack. If you're in the States, you probably know which one I'm talking about. When I took the job, it was explained to me that a majority of my salary was commission-based. That didn't bother me because even the base salary was decent at the time. Besides, the lowest financial band to qualify for commission required me to sell 10 dresses a week. Easy. During my interview, I explained to my manager that I would need to get off of work at 3 p.m. on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays to attend all my classes. Now, if you've ever worked a retail job at all, you know that the daytime hours Monday through Thursday, as well as those evening hours, tend to be very low volume. The majority of all sales are made on Friday through Saturday, with the casual shoppers coming in on a Saturday and the serious shoppers coming in on a Sunday. Therefore, my manager had no problems with me needing those days off every week. My schedule was set as Monday, Thursday, Friday during the day, as well as all day Saturday and Sunday. However, within two weeks of being there, it became apparent that one of the older women I worked with did have a problem with my schedule. She disliked working the weekday evenings and days because those hours typically didn't result in sales. Instead, most of our time was spent cleaning and restocking inventory. At first, it started as a few nasty comments here and there on the floor. Then she started borrowing items from my bridal drawer. Belly bumps, pins, hair ties, tissues, cough drops. Eventually, she started telling the hostess to remove my name from the incoming bridal inventory, claiming I was busy with another client when I was not. The final straw came when she had to work one of my daytime shifts. I was studying for an exam at the time. And one of my high dollar brides came in. Instead of ringing the sell through with my name as the consultant as per policy, the computer automatically registers who is the consultant, she removed my name and put her name as the consultant instead. That one sell was over $200 in commission. I was livid. Of course, I brought it up to my manager, and that did not go as planned, because the other consultant had more seniority than I did. My manager flipped the table on me and claimed that maybe if I pulled my weight and pushed through more sales, I wouldn't be in this position. Apparently, my refusal to take evening shifts during the week was upsetting to other consultants because they had to work those low volume hours. This made me think, what the hell, I was working all the daytime shifts. The manager started badgering me that I needed to find a way to pull in more business for the bridal shop and close more sales, or she would demote me to stockroom employee. Okay, you want me to bring in more business? Game on. Now, I knew from a previous interaction in the shop that both my managers and this consultant took moral issue with anyone associated with the Alphabet Mafia, aka the LGBTQ+. For instance, we had a lesbian couple come in once looking for two wedding gowns, and the manager made them so uncomfortable with their religious talk that both brides left. Another time, the consultant had refused to dress a male in a prom gown because it was an atrocity and disgusted her. I, however, didn't give a damn what you were doing with your merchandise after you purchase it. And I have a lot of friends in the Alphabet Mafia. I immediately called one of my good friends who was a well-known local drag queen and asked him if he knew anyone in need of a special occasion gown. I offered special consultations complete with bra fittings during the daytime hours I worked. The first day, three drag queens showed up. The next, it was four. Saturday involved five drag queens, three lesbian brides, and a few flamboyantly gay men there for support. It may have gotten out of hand on Sunday when a whole van of drag queens drove in from over an hour away just to see me and started a ruckus with the religious nuts in the store. I had to take half of them to the salon to dress them and I made a huge amount in commission that week. The next week, a good number of my clientele continued to come into the shop, always insisting on me and demanding I be listed as their consultant. The manager was ticked and the other consultant was disgusted. But what could they really do? All my manager asked me to do was increase my sales, which I had done in spades. I ultimately left a few weeks later, which was planned as I had graduated and taken a professorship at a state school some hours away. But I did learn from the assistant manager at that store that the Alphabet Mafia continued to flamboyantly frequent that store for their bridal and formal wear needs until it ultimately closed down six months later. Remember to tip your waitresses and don't ever upset the drag queens. This was awesome. I usually dislike drama at the workplace, but the moment you mess with my time and my money, all bets are off. 
Also, bringing in the alphabet mafia to annoy some religious co-workers was the icing on the cake. Manager says I need to find a better reason to work here instead of money. This story is an old but gold one. My first job was a terrible office supply store, often associated with staplers. Started under a great GM who got transferred to bail out a failing store. Our new guy was fresh from corporate with a name like Joe or John, most generic overly smiling white guy who sprouts corporate slogans. Well, he drove off all of the cashiers except little old me who was a fresh faced just out of high school idiot. He blocked my transfer to be a tech, approved by the old GM, and as I said, he ran off every cashier. It came to a head one day where he scheduled a tech to cover the register for closing, and the tech didn't show up because why would he? He didn't want to sit at a cash register. Naturally, he tells me that I have to stay there until someone comes to relieve me. Being young, I just went with it, but had a time I had to be gone by to get to class. That time comes and I make a fuss and the manager comes to relieve me instead. He decides that I'm out of line for not staying past a 12 hour shift and putting class above work. He lays into me about this and how a customer heard me complaining how unacceptable this was. Not like he let me take a break anyway so I had nowhere else to complain at. It all culminates in this big what was probably supposed to be an inspiring speech about what motivates me to which I say money. What else motivates a minimum wage cashier to work there? This makes him quite upset and he babbles that it's not a good enough reason. Demands I go home, look deep inside myself and I better find another reason or else this job isn't a good fit for me. And he wants it to be a good fit for me because he sees big things in my future, management things. So naturally I change in the bathroom and I go to class, think long and hard and come back to hand in my two weeks as clearly I wasn't a good fit. Then a day later, after a terrible closing shift, I just don't come back. Even told the closing manager, wouldn't it be funny if I just didn't come in and open tomorrow? Which was met with a very serious stern, don't even joke about that, it's not funny. To which I replied, who said I'm joking, before walking away and never speaking to them again. Probably not as funny as I thought, most of the funny parts were his face, the shock when his inspirational heart to heart had me quitting rather than pleading allegiance to the company, and management when it dawned on them that I was just done. By all means I complied. I couldn't find another reason besides money so I found another job that night that was a better fit. And I was going to joke about not coming in, but they annoyed me being all serious about not joking so I turned the joke into not a joke. The story reminded me of a time at my old job where I had to stay an extra hour or so after because no one was there to relieve me from my position. I kept calling the third shift supervisor to get an answer but they just ignored me. So after a couple hours, I just clocked out, got in my car and left. I heard no one showed up for another hour or so after I had left. I was told to never do that again, but I didn't really get in trouble because I was one of the better employees and I trained most of the new guys that got hired. So there are benefits to being the best at your job. Am I the jerk? I haven't done anything productive since 2018. I started working office jobs after college in late 2014. I was a super hard worker, always got recognition as the top performer, the go-to guy, my boss's favorite, but I also had so much respect for my peers. I finally got a job in coding which was my goal in 2017. I continued doing my best, but this environment was different. There were politics and managers picked favorites. My coworkers weren't as nice or welcoming. I worked really hard and got a below average performance review in 2017. I felt very resentful. I tried to work for a bit in 2018 but just felt demotivated. I started playing games and reading about subjects that interested me on my computer. I started taking walks during the day. Since everyone was always in pointless meetings and rarely at their desks, it wasn't suspicious. Coworkers and I would make fake status reports and numbers to report on how we were saving the company money when in reality we didn't do anything all day. We would schedule meetings and then just hang out at a coffee shop. I felt like I deserved a break after burning myself out. Also, I still attend meetings and always made sure that I talked. I actually missed this a lot. In 2019, we got a new manager who literally ignored us completely. She no longer works there. This manager literally was only in the office building for 30 minutes out of the whole workday. This enabled me to slack off even more. We did get assigned a few interesting projects, so there was a month or two where I actually did work on stuff, but we did it as slow as possible. I took many three hour long walks during the workday. In 2020, I got sent home. I got promoted to a job where I would be implementing an SQL database. I was so qualified for that. 
The new manager changed his mind and wanted me instead to program in a language that I had never used before. My peers openly made fun of me for not knowing. It was super toxic. I was moved to another job where I knew the language, but most of 2020 I did not work. I'd work for 30 minutes out of the day and then goof off at home. In 2021, I continued to work from home and had an illness. This is when I almost got caught. I'd run to the bathroom during Zoom calls, take time off when I had no energy and hives. Ironically, my new manager for the year came down hard on me. I reported her as homophobic and quit a few months later. In 2022, I had job hopped for a 60% raise and I hoped that this was the end of my slacking. I still work from home. I thought maybe the management at this company wasn't helping and it was a fresh start for me to have a new attitude. Well, my new company is just as dysfunctional and they don't give me anything to do. I've been finding things to do to help them, but still spend a majority of my day not working and not contributing really as it's just busy work. I hope one day I can go back to early in my career when I was engaged and motivated. I want to be like that, but now I'm reflecting on how it's been for years and I'm not really doing anything productive. This is pretty relatable. I've mentioned it before, but when you are good at your job and your company doesn't really appreciate the work you do, it's so easy to slack off. I've mostly experienced this when working for billion dollar companies like my last job. I had my old job down to a science to the point where I knew things could be an issue and I was usually there to fix every problem. So eventually I started taking my laptop to work, hiding in a small corner and editing YouTube videos. I figured why not work on something that I loved and get paid for doing it since there was so much downtime. I never really got in trouble for doing this. I would bring out my computer in front of management. This was 100% against the rules by the way, but when you are good at what you do, higher ups tend to let things slide because it's easier to do that instead of training new people if they were to fire you. Am I the jerk? I follow orders and it ruins people's day. I'm a machinist and welder for the USAF. And beyond what you can imagine from that, I also remove stuck hardware from aircrafts and components when needed. We support a lot of agencies on base, but operate out of the flight line. A few years ago, I was stationed in the Midwest working on tankers. I was a young airman and was doing well enough to help with running the second shift. I was running the machine shop floor and managing the other airmen on shift while our shift lead was there to assist in maintenance and inspecting other required repairs. It should be said that I was known as a nonsense attitude and getting into verbal disagreements with anyone who tried to push us around and tried to get us to do things without following orders in the right procedures. I would tell anyone, regardless of rank, that it was not right and that they can come back when they had the right paperwork. I was called the destroyer of dreams by leadership simply by doing the right thing and making people's lives harder for it. Anyways, one particular Friday night, I was sitting at one of the computers in our office checking on what maintenance we had left on my email. Our production superintendent walked in and said that some crew chiefs needed some assistance with the fastener they broke off in something. I grab one of the new airmen and we go out to the spot where the job is. Upon arrival, I have my airmen grab the tools to remove the broken screw while I find out what happened. That's when I met the guy who was in charge out there. We'll call him Jeffrey. He was a master sergeant in the ANG, the Air National guard. He explained to me that they broke a screw off in the cover plate of the auxiliary power unit. I make sure that the job is in all the forms as the aircrafts have to track maintenance and get Jeffrey guys to put the job in there while I go to work. When I get up there, I immediately discover that drilling into this thing is not going to be viable. The cover plate is flat, but it's tilting back and forth on its axis whenever you put pressure on it. Normally, you want to drill into something that is stable and moving around as you don't want to damage anything else. We couldn't get the damn thing to stop moving, and I called down to Jeffrey to let him know that it would need to be brought in so we can swap it out. He looked up and said that that's not possible. He began to explain that it would be an eight hour process to remove the APU just to get the plate out and over to us. He proceeded to climb up and try to show us to hold and drill the plate. My airman and I just looked at each other. We just tried that. I tried again to drill it, but the plate just moved around and started to get damaged. I looked down and this is the conversation that followed. Hey sir, this isn't working and it's going to come out. You just need to keep trying. We've been out here all night and want to go home. I proceed to call and my shift lead tells me that it needs to come out and I told him how adamant the crew chiefs were. He grabbed our super and this man told us to give him a moment. He came back and said that we have three replacement parts on base. Do your thing. I looked down and I told the guys that we were in the clear to proceed. 
Remember when Jeffrey told me that it was an eight hour process just to get the plate out? Well, I guess those guys are about to find out what happens when you don't listen to the subject matter experts of screw removal. I begin to drill and have my airman try to hold the plate in place. What do you know, it still moves around and drills off center and into the threads of the cover plate. This makes the plate unusable and needs to be replaced. This took all of five minutes and now will take a total of 16 hours to replace. I pack my tools in my bag and climb down and tell the airman to put the tools back in their box, which followed was the best moment in my life. Sir, we tried to drill it as you wanted, but the part is damaged, so we're good to go and replace the part? No sir, the screw is still in there and we damaged the part trying to drill it. We went through the threads and into the part. It's destroyed. He simply looked down inside and told his guys to pack it up. We went back to the shop and got ready to go home. From what I heard, the guard guys were hazed by the active crew chief for making them come out on the weekend and not listening to us. I continued to be a pain to those who dared and was stationed somewhere else a year and a half later in Asia. And this, kids, is why you don't cut corners and you listen to the people that know what they're talking about. But to play devil's advocate, the expert dudes can be pretty annoying sometimes. That's it for today's video. If you want to make sure you don't miss out on any content, hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit that bell to turn on notifications. If you want to finish listening to all those stories, use the playlist at the top of the description. And if you're someone who live streams and needs copyright free music, check out the Cream of the Crop music by searching Cream of the Stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you choose. Remember, it's free.